Thank you. Um, my name is Hannah Sutherland and I'm one of the events officers for the ICON Textile Committee. We are thrilled this afternoon to have a couple of the team from Heritage Trimmings joining us to give us a talk about all the work that they do. And a big hello, a big welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank and you I'm very much. much. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> and I'll see you later for questions. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, sorry about the little technical hitch there. Uh, my name is Rachel Travell and I'm the General Manager of Heritage Trimmings and this is Ruth Hayes and she's our Production Manager at Heritage. Okay, so I've been at Heritage now for 22 years and I've worked in the design department the whole time I've been here and gradually worked my way through. So I've seen a lot of uh, projects come and go over this time. Um, I have a qualification in woven textiles, did a degree, so I've got a lot of uh, interesting weaving um, and I'll pass you over to Ruth and she can give you a bit about herself. I'm Ruth Hayes, I've worked at Heritage for just over 20 years. I work primarily in the production side and I've done everything from production weaving up to my current role as production manager. I also have a degree in women textiles like Rachel and obviously we've both taken slightly different routes. Rachel's concentrated on design, I'm being more on the production side. So this is why we're where we are today. So, right, we'll start with the first slide. So our history. So uh, trimmings has been used um, for, since around the 1300s and they're typically used for finishing and uh, embellishing um, interiors so curtains sofas wall hangings cushion seating um to enhance the fabric sometimes the trimmings can be ex as more expensive than the actual fabric um and it was also in times gone by a way of indicating wealth within this and status within the household so the company was formed in 1991 by nick and karen tubbs um and the first project they worked on was the restoration of Hampton Court Palace, the King's apartment, due to the fire. Um, so this was, uh, we were employed to weave golden braids, silver braids for walling, curtaining, for the beds, things like that. From this, we gained a reputation for restoration and also started working on trims collections for small and larger interior companies. Over the years, the business has grown and we have gained a good reputation in the industry. Um, in 2022, so beginning of this year, we were taken over by the Edward Alexander Group, um, who was established by the Eightfield Capital Partners, who have a portfolio of companies devoted to ensuring British craftsmanship thrive in the UK and internationally. Um, so in our um, group, we have Gainsborough, the fabric weaving company based in Sudbury, um, Collier Webb, a lighting and hardware company based in Eastbourne, George Spencer, they do interior fabrics and trimmings and they're based in London. And McKinney do curtain poles and finials and they're also based in London. And Heritage has actually fit really well into the group itself. This, this slide is um, showing a bit of the history of the building that we're now in. If you look at the picture on the left, the building on the right, is the building we're now in. It was originally the canteen or mess room for the foundry that used to be on this industrial site. Um, on the slide on the right shows the interior of the building when it was actually used as the works canteen. As you can see, it's quite a large area and um, it was used for a lot as well as for feeding the workforce, you can see by the stage, it was also used as a, for entertainment for the workers, um, social gatherings and that kind of thing. The building itself is got quite a large floor pl uh, plan. So it obviously works for us with all the looms, the arm store and all the machinery we need to work with today. And if you kind of look now, when you see the pictures of the factory, you'll actually see it's not really changed much as a structure itself. You can really see all these elements still around in the factory today. The um, Lee's foundry that used to be on here was probably the largest employer of 
people in Derbyshire. Derbyshire, Derby itself has got quite an industrial heritage. You've got the Lees Foundry, which was a big employer, the railways, Rolls Royce, and there used to be a lot more text, a lot of textiles mills in the area as well that um, produced anything from cloth to trimmings. So we have that kind of industrial background to ourselves. Um, obviously this is all now gone and we are in the last two remaining buildings that are left from the original foundry, but we've tried to protect the history. As you can see, we still have the plaque that was um, put on the wall in memory of Sir Francis Lay so, uh, by the workers so that um, his memory was held and we've obviously kept that in situ where it should be. So this is um, the building now. So it looks very similar to what you've probably seen in the earlier photographs. Um, it's an ideal place for us because we get really good light. As you can see from the gantry on the top, we've got a lot of light coming in there. And obviously we've got an, a large amount of windows and it's really important uh, that we've got this uh, light to actually to produce the trimmings. Um, and I'll pop you on to, obviously this is the internal view of the factory from looking from the stage end down. So you can see we've got plenty of room for the large jacquard looms that we use, as well as quite a substantial yarn store at the back so that we have everything on site to hand so that basically we can start with a yarn of comb from the yarn store and take it all the way through to the finished products. And again, you can see that it's actually quite a light and airy building and we've got plenty of room for the workings on the looms and plenty of light to be able to work with. And again, this is another angle that you can actually see in the background what we call the stage, which is where there used to be the entertainment stage for the workers, but we still use that for their twisting and cord department for the factory. And obviously in the front, you can see one of the old jacquards and although it's in parts because we have to take the um, backboard off for storage. We've still got the original card cutter on the left um, so that we can actually still cut the original pattern cards for the original jacquards. Whereas if you can just see in the background by the windows, you can actually Which see fluorescent. Yeah, our right. um, Rolls Royce what we call the Rolls-Royce loom, which is our most modern computerized jacquard loom that has 356 hooks, sorry, that um, all lift individually so that we can do quite complex and intricate patterns on that one. So how we work at Heritage, um, obviously we've got the design office where we, there's three of us working there. So all our inquiries come through design um, the actual image on screen basically shows you um, a standard kind of color matching that we would send out to our clients. So our clients would send us a fabric in. We would then talk to them about kind of what materials they would like us to use. Um, have they got a budget in mind? So this is just an example of one that we've done. So obviously it's got the gold in the background, the red. So we've, we've provided with a, a selection of different colors to choose from. Um, we look at different types of projects. Um, we work with interior designers. We work with, um, we do restoration work. We work with conser conservation people, organizations like the National Trust, English Heritage, Royal Palaces, National Buildings, Stately Homes and Museums. But the mainstay of our work is actually production for trimmings in the UK. We do work in US and Europe, but not so much. Um, our main materials that we use at Heritage would be a spun rayon, um, cotton, wool, linen, and silk. Uh, this is actually, actually the picture there is actually silk um, color matchings that we've done there. Um, we also, all our trims, so tie backs, um, drops, rosettes and things like that that are used. We, we use wood. Um, we have a local wood turner that's also based in Derby that we draw designs out for and send them out to him and he turns our shape. So if your client's wanting to do something specific or is a historic representation that we're trying to achieve, we can, we can do everything for you. Um, we've got a portfolio that we take out to clients and obviously this is kind of samples of things that we've made in the past for people and um, so colorized design wise 
Um, we can either reproduce those in your own colour matchings, we can re reproduce them in exactly as they are now, and we can also work to develop things with yourselves. So obviously once things have gone through the process of the design stage and then they go through the specification stage in the um, design office, they, it then starts to progress through the factory. Here we've got an image of the uh, walking area, which mm, the majority of our products require walks, um, whether it's woven products, whether it's embellishments or tassel fringes or tie backs. Warping is a big part of the production process. This is a power operated warping wheel. Its circumference is about 4.65 meters and we can get 26 runs of that on it. So we can do warps over about 121 meters, which means that we can produce 100 meters of braid in one go if we want. Um, and we can um, also then produce the large amount of material needed for things like the tassel fringes and um, mold covers and that kind of thing. If you can see on the warping mold, there's a piece of paper that's there with a clip that also gives the instructions to the warper. So each product would have its own formula. So we write a specification stating what yarns we need to be used, what colours need to be used, so that the rotation always is correct to the design. So if we're doing a stock collection for somebody, they always follow the same rotation. So the product will always come out there or thereabouts the same as it would, do, yeah. would have in the pattern box. So it's a very important piece of paper. Yeah, and um, the we work on what we call runs. So one run will be going right to left and the second run will then go left to right and we have um, two pegs which we can cross the thread so that that way we can count the amount of yarn that goes onto the warp itself so like I say uh, like Rachel was saying with that and the specifications we can actually replicate products time and time again here it shows the kind of uh, materials we work with. We have the large cone at the top, and obviously the ones that Adrian's tying in, they're actually, as you can see, sewing threads, which we work with quite a lot mm -hmm. as well. Um, we can have what uh, up to about 20 ends on, so we can recre recreate quite thick warps if we need to, or if we want, we just have one or two on and then make quite fine warps that way. So they put the tension on so that everything is under a similar tension on the warping wheel. So we've got consistency once it gets onto the machines or into handwork. Another thing is when with regards to color, we never really generally do a solid color of anything. All our trims tend to be of a blended yarn. So you've got a really nice color palette and also for consistency when it comes to reproducing things. If one color is slightly off one way, it can balance out another with regards to the other color changing that. Once um, the warp's produced, you can see here that the um, warp beams that the warps get wound onto are then going into the back of one of the looms. And again, these are all run under tension and run through a reed at the back which spaces the yarns out so that then they can be threaded up in the correct order through the eyes or males on the looms and then through the same kind of reed on the front which dictates the width and um, set of the uh, braid itself. You may, also, you may also notice there's a couple of different black reels and um, depending on if it's a mix of yarn we may put one yarn on one reel and another yarn and another reel because if you try and mix them together you'll get tension issues so we always try where we can to separate things out so it just makes it easy when it comes to running it in the loop that we don't have any tension issues and also if the braid's quite a lot a large braid and there's a lot of yarn involved we need to split that over a number of beams to actually make it so that it's actually weavable and um, here we have the um 
Absolutely. We have the uh, two of the bait, what we call the baby jacquards, the 60 Bs, running two different style braids. This one here is quite a simple braid and quite fine, as you can see from the threads and the weft. Whereas this one, and obviously this is showing you the jacquard workings, obviously a jacquard and uh, lifts each end in the loom individually. So we can get quite intricate designs. As you can see here, you've got a little dot going on. Whereas if it was on a shaft setup, it would be a lot more difficult to get that kind of shape. So these yeah. usually run about average about 15 to 20 mm -hmm. meters an hour. Um, and they're single shuttles, so single colored weft. Whereas some of the bigger jacquards, we can put extra shuttles in to make them so we can put three and four colors yeah. in the weft. And it's all down to what clients want to spend. I mean, if they want to keep braid prices so that they're not too expensive, then we'll look at doing single shuttle jobs. If they want something more complex, then we'll go to the slower jacquards that can run up to four shuttles. And it's just down to what the client would like in their product. So these two jacquards also are weave up to a, a two inches in width, whereas the other jacquards, the bigger jacquards, have got a four and a half inch weaving slot so we can get the wider braids into those. Obviously, what weaving's consisted of warp and weft. So this is where we wind the weft for the actual weaving so that Obviously, the warp and the weft then mesh together once it's in the loom. You can see at the front, we've got the little bobbins or pins that the um, threads get wound onto. And obviously, we can have 20, 30 ends on, or we can just have two. It just depends on each job. And these are all wound by a little electric driven mechanical winder that will stop at the right size so that they don't get too big for the shuttles. We can also set up, um, obviously Marilyn and Rachel, if they're weaving, they'll be running more than one loom at a time. So you could have a number of different um, jobs actually set up on the creel and they wind whilst they're weaving. So they know how long the actual looms will run without them watching them. So they can come and wind between jobs and that's how we try to keep the, the machines moving. OK, so this is the hand loom, um, one of our hand looms that we've got. So it's a 16 shaft um, dobby loom. Um, so obviously the shafts are the wooden bar that runs across and then you've got the heddles, which are the white bits in the image there. Um, this loom actually works off of a, um, a peg. peg system, sorry, get my brain working, <laughs> a peg system on a leg chain. So the pattern is put on, so there's little bars that run around and every time they get to a pin, the shafts will lift. Um, and if you look over onto the left-hand side, you've got a white piece of paper and there's kind of a bit of graph paper on there. That's actually got the pattern on that this design of braid was running from. And this also has all the instructions, so the warping instructions and the weft instructions for this project. Um, this is actually a gimp braid, so it's a cotton braid, and then we've got gimps that cross over. Um, and as you can see in the shuttle on the side there, the left, that is actually a two, two gimp shuttle job. So there were two shuttles, and they've both got two gimps in each, and it's a constant crossing left to right on the pattern. This was a more complex hand-woven braid that it took an hour to weave three quarters of a metre. And as you can see, there's quite a few things going on there that's involved a lot of processes in the factory. So obviously you've got your standard warp, then you've got a corded Bouclet, warp, yeah. which is the thicker bobbly threads that you can see at the back of the baton. And then you can see again that there's different um, weft structures going on as well. I'll just play the video for that. So every so, time that the um, design hits the, as I say, the metal, uh, what's that mean? I think I'm so every time the um, metal pin hits the uh, chain, it'll lift. So at the moment, uh, Fiona's just putting the detail section in. So this is the boucle cord that we've made. There's a viscose and she's got to go around, I think it's about six times. So each every time she comes to this repeat in the, in the job, this is what she'll have to do. 
So it's it's quite good with it being on a leg chain because it'll automatically tell her what she needs to do as she's going on so she can see the design building up in front of her. Um, this is a 15 centimetre wide braid, so it's quite a complex one and there is an extremely large amount of ends in there. So it took two people to set that loom up and um, probably a day to thread it in. So as you can see, some of some of it can be quite labour intensive. So and uh, she's just finishing up with the bouquet. what bouquet bubble, and then uh, she'll go back to putting ground weft in now. So that will then secure the actual stock so in place. It then tightens up, and the tuft is held in its place in the braid. Okay. So this is another um, also hand waving gimp braid that Fiona's weaving on the, the Dobby Loom. This has got a cotton warp and a cotton weft. And then the gimp we call is a detail. So the looping detail that's laid on the top of the gimp braid is actually the design. The gimp is made by a number of ends running down through our gimp machine. And then at speed, we get um, another cover yarn that goes round to secure the gimps in place. It gets quite a it's quite a stiff um, product when it's done, so it'll hold in place and makes a really nice trimming. Okay, All right, now we'll move up onto the stage where we assemble things like the gimps, the cords, um, twists for bullion fringes, which are like a twisty fringe that goes at the base of sofas traditionally. So if you watch this video, you can actually see how the cord is assembled as it goes through the machine. This is a soft spun cord, so it's kind of produced in different ways. So it's a thing, as you can see, the carousel spinning, there's colored reels on there. They're loose threads, that actually, as they come up through the machine, they start to twist. So you can just see on the video them kind of coming up across. So they're twisting all the time. And then they come to a point where the three ends will then meet. And you can see then as they come through the plate at the top, they then twist together to create the cord and it'll go down and it feeds itself onto a reel. Um, and then this can, once this is finished, it can be taken off. We can flange it or we can have it um, just as it is used for cushioning, for piping on different pieces of furniture. Um, so that's... And as the cord goes through, the, um, the first time you see it it'll be twisted in one direction and then as it gets assembled to lock it into place it gets twisted in the opposite direction so that then it's held and it won't actually spring open once it's relaxed off the machine so and with the, regards to color you can have up to four different color strands so it doesn't all have to be the same shade depending on what requirements you have it can be three different colors four different colors and then obviously when it comes together you get a really nice finished cord um, so this is another part of the stage. So here we have in the middle of the, the, uh, the image, there is our gimping machine. So this is where we make the gimp for hand weaving. Um, we make gimps for people for embroidery. Um, we make gimps for tie back components, for embellishments and things like that. In the bottom left hand corner, this is our winding machine. This is where when we when our yarn comes in, it comes in quite big, chunky reels of yarn and sometimes when we're making trimmings we need a, a large number of ends so we have to split the material down so these are run quite regularly just making the big cheese of yarn down into a smaller amount um, and then behind that machine there you've got two of our knitting machines um, these are used for a less expensive type of trim so we kind of cover a really broad um, amount of costing so these are made for making knitted braids, knitted bullions and things like that. For we didn't do bagpipe fringes. There's all different types of trim you can make on there, but it's a more cost effective way of making trimmings. As you can see, you've got the um, twister in the background, which will twist um, the bullion twine for the bullion fringes that we produce and um, you can see there that the lads are actually looking at the specification for the next job that they're going to produce so 
it's just everything pr processed through the, throughout the, the um, factory isn't it yeah and then in the rear of that you've got a really big machine and that's at one of our big cord machines so this makes cord up to about two inches in diameter so like um the stair ropes and things like that so just it kind of goes from a really really tiny cord and you can get some a, a real vast array of things yeah we can go from a few mil up to the two inches so. yeah and every size in between yeah <laughs> okay so this is a video again and um, this is diane and um, all our tassel fringes are hand tassel this is actually a bobble fringe but any any of the handwork obviously so on here you've got the balls are actually wooden balls that then we then cover um with thread um and i'll just play this so you can see how it all works so the balls are threaded on individually onto a strong thread um, she then places a little glass bead in the bottom and then goes back up through the ball And then she'll go back up the ball um, and then the little glass ball then secures the bee, the actual bobble in place. And then she'll go around a couple of times to secure that so it doesn't come off. And she can do about a metre an hour of that. Yeah. So as you can see, again, it's pretty hands on and quite labour intensive. OK, then we're just going to have a look at, through a few of our projects that we've done over the years. So this is um, a project we did at Knoll. Um, as you can see in the picture there, you've got um, the before and after. Um, so I was invited to visit um, the conservation studio um, to look at recreating the trim for the sofas and chair. Um, the problem with this is they didn't want the trimmings to look new. They wanted the trimmings to look old and aged so that they don't kind of obviously kind of stand off. And as you can see in the furniture here, um, they, they weren't replacing the fabric. So it really needed to, to sit nicely with what was existing. Um, so these are a few of the photographs we took prior to uh, making the trim. As you can see, the trims are on ton there at the moment. And on the chair here, you can see where the, the original trims were applied. Um, you can still see some of the stitching that was there originally. And then um, this, I've got three images. We did three trims for this, um, these chairs and sofa. So a trim went around the back of the chair, one went across the front. So, and there were different trims used in different areas. Um, so this is an existing piece um, that we took photographs of while we, there, while we were there. And you can see that it's had a bit of a hard life the materials are starting to rot away. Obviously, they've got really dirty over time. Um, the environment doesn't help um, with the dust and things like that. And obviously, if you brush a bit past things and as the silk gets older, it just starts to disintegrate. Um, this is the same trimming, but the smaller version, because there was two trims that were the same design, but obviously two different lengths. But this is the back side of the trimming. And you're surprising sometimes when you're having to recreate things. It's really interesting to look at the back of the trim as well as the front because it can tell you a really good story of how the, the product's constructed. So between myself and Ruth, we worked on this to try and deconstruct it and obviously try and then to obviously put the trim back together. This is this is a third trim. This is the longest one and the most intricate trim that we did. Um, as you can see, um, we've got across the top doing the undulating um, shape. We've, that is what we call the gimp. Um, so you can see the stuffy yarn um, that's there and you can still see a little bit of the cover, but you can see how it's worn away and rotted away. Um, and again, we didn't want to make these look brand new. So the way going forward, we looked at the colour, making the colour so that it actually look aged and also the finishing process in this. Um, like when you when you do silk, when it's new, it, it kind of sticks out and it just, it it's not got the age look. So we had to find ways of putting something on it to actually make it look like it's been stuck together for a while. So we, we got a starch solution that we had to drip everything in and that really did change the colour and everything, it dulled them down. And just gave it that 
aged dusty effect that the knoll was requiring for it to sit correctly with the existing fabric so, so it's quite interesting when we get projects like this because it we have to think of ways to fill the brief but with um modern, modern techniques yeah i mean years ago this would have all literally been made by hand so it's trying to I mean, the trim was made by hand, but like the gimps and things would have been made by hand. They'd have been spun by hand, whereas now we make them on machine. So it's trying to make something on the machine looks like something that's handmade. Um, okay. Here, <clears throat> sorry. Here you can see the hand weaver assembling what we call the tassel carrier. So this is the body that all the embellishments will sit on and be attached to to complete the tassel fringe so she's weaving with two of the whipped gimps that now are how they would have been when they were brand new on the trims that we got from Noel um you've got the whipped gimps that I think they were silk yeah um the actual what we call tassel carrier which is the braid part and the loops they were made out of spun silk the um actual weft which is like little bits of string that was actually spun spun silk to make a small cord up um which is again going back to what we were saying we can make very fine cords or we can go up to two inches and um this was hand woven so she would make about a meter an hour of this again because it was quite finely picked um as you can see there's only two ends of the yarn actually in the weft so there's quite a lot of what we call picks to the inch there you can also see a piece of string sitting just above the actual main part of the braid this is what we call a dead end we use it to make it so that we can count the loops for the actual tasseling so that it keeps the underneath and the, the top of the loop separate so then when we're applying the tassels we can actually get the correct number of loops together to be able to attach the embellishments on okay so this is actually the replication of the the most complex one that we did so you can see there um this has got about 500 500 bundles per meter so it's a really really over the top trim it's actually a double layer trim so the back layer is all is the longest level and it's straight and then the top level has got the gimp heading in it and it's got it goes up and down so as the elements are actually tied in the actual little bows themselves are made by a length of silk um that are then knotted at specific places along the length, so say like a meter, and then they're bundled into a small bow. The bow is then put through the loop of like the tassel carrier Ruth was just talking about, and then bound in place. So on that one, I think we were saying it was going to take um, a day to produce a meter of that trim. So you can see how how labor intensive that would be. And then on the heading part there, there is two different types of tufts. So you've got a, a button tuft and you've got like a looped rosette and that they alternate throughout the piece as well. So as you can see with this, this piece of trim would actually involve every department in the factory. So you'd have the warping, you'd have the, the weaving, you'd have the gimp cover, you'd have the cord making, and then you'd have the hand assembly as well. So, so every every department in the company would have been involved in some part of creating that trim so quite a lot of people just to make something to look at which we get quite proud of so this is the shorter version of the um the two of the similar trims um this is really complex and it was quite a difficult trim to do because it was so short and to try and get all these elements in such a small space so on this trim across the bottom, so you've got the gimp heading at the top and then the onions are put on um, every other um, uh, so that you can put the detail in. And then on the bottom part of this, we have got boucle tufts. So they're little individual buttons that are created by using a boucle yarn that we actually make before we make the boucle tufts. 
you've got the tassels themselves and then you've got something that we call flies and that is a warp of silk that's knotted at either end and then cut and then they're bundled into a little bow and there's probably about five or six little flies together and it kind of all goes spiky so it creates this and you can see with regards to colour when we were talking about trying to age things by the colour if you look at the onions at the top you can actually see the different tones of silk we've used there to obviously try and create this effect where things have faded and some things are stronger which I think is, is it made a really lovely trim and then the next slide is obviously the longer version of it um, this this piece hasn't actually been starched, so this is an actually original piece before it was finished. Um, but again, it was a lot easier to tassel because you've got that little bit more length to move things about. Right, this was a project we did just at the end of lockdown. Um, they wanted to restore the Lord Mayor's carriage in London but it was a mixture of rest restoration and conservation. Because of the budget, they couldn't afford to completely rework all of the trimmings. So it was a case of rescuing what we could, reworking what we couldn't, and getting the new and the old to sit together so that it didn't look obvious that any work had been done on it, but it looked smart enough to do the role it needs to do. Is it a bit of a longer lie? Okay, so, um, right, this is the hammer cloth. So this is the bit where they sit, the driver would sit at the front of the carriage. Um, so it's a felt background. And as you can see, this is actually the corner of one of the, um, the corner of the hammer cloth. So the top part there, you can see that's kind of falling to pieces, it's actually a ribbon braid. So we had to remake this and we had to remake it wider because we didn't take anything off. We kind of kept the original stuff there. So we kind of covered it over. And there was a few tears actually in the hammer cloth that we were then able to disguise within, within this braid. Also, you can see from the gimp braid, which is the yellow, red and white braid here, the actual white part of the braid should actually be yellow. But again, over time, it's worn away. So you've got the actual, what we call the gut showing. So this is the cord that's underneath. So this type of gimp, we would class as a crinkle gimp because it's made of a cord underneath. And then when the silk goes over, it all goes bumpy. So it creates this really nice shimmery effect on, on the gimp braid itself. Um, okay, so this here is also the tie back. So you can really see how um, things have rotted away. So the silk cover there, I've taken the rough off to kind of deconstruct it to see obviously how it was made originally. And you can really see where it's worn. The wool itself is probably the thing that survived the best out of it all. because I think wool tends to have a bit better life than silk does. Um, so what we did with this, the wool, we actually didn't remake the wool skirts or anything that was on this project to do with the wool. We actually turned them inside out. So the original colour um, was still there um, and then we kind of recovered the moulds and things which we'll show you further on. Um, okay. So again you can see the difference between what has seen the light and with the slide on the right what hasn't been affected by sunlight, weather, um, atmospheric conditions. So it was mixing the blend so that we sat with the worn product, but also brought in a bit of the freshness of the colours that have been protected. So the, the slide on the right obviously shows you the underneath side of the tie back when we've taken the skirt off what was left. So everything was matched to this with regards to the colour. So the silk wrappings we did were approved on site um, by the client. And obviously then when we came back, everything was made in these colours. So there were three drops involved in the um, on the bullion fringe. So the shorter drops were actually on the tassel tassels that were on the four corners. And then the middle drop was at the top of the bullion fringe and the longer one hung on the bottom of the bullion fringe. And then in between all of these, you can see there's like a wool tuft. We removed these, cleaned these and reused them. Um, and obviously where we've got bits missing, which are obviously over time, things have dropped off, we then replaced 
Um, we tried wherever possible to use the original material. So we stripped back all the original drops and we used as many as we could. And then we got um, the extra molds to return so that obviously they, they matched by our wood turner. So this is actually one of the rosettes. So rosettes and tassels will sit on all four corners of the uh, hammer cloth. And unfortunately, when people get on the hammer cloth, they tend to use a tassel to pull themselves up. And you can see here where the gimps got stretched. Um, so we had to work out how to make the gimps, obviously how to reconstruct the actual gimp braid itself, because uh, the, so the gimp ring itself, because um, it doesn't look, <laughs> very good at the moment so okay so these are actually a copy of the drops the longer drops that we did so there's different elements so on the right hand side you can actually just see the single drop so the top bobble on that one would be covered twice so we would cover it in and strike it in yellow first and then we would go back and fill in the red and then they would be bound into place and then the, also the bottom mold, we would cover it all in red and then we would apply the striping cord, which is the yellow lines that come down afterwards. So they really look magnificent in a box together. So when we deliver them, it's quite a proud moment seeing these actually going back on. So this one here is obviously the new tie back mold that's been recovered. So all our molds are covered by hand. So they're warped and then we use a post and we cover them and then we apply the boucle striping after to put the detailing on. And then we then tie the right mold around the middle with a strong thread because we need that to pull in to actually then be able to apply the skirts back on. Okay, so these are the finished um, rosette and tassels. So you can see where the new elements are. You can see, obviously we've reused on the left, the striping cord, which is the right, um, the white cord. You can still see that there's a little bit of the yellow still there. So it's just nice to be able to see. And obviously when it's reapplied back to the hammer cloth, you can see that it will link in really well. So this is then all then being re reattached to the uh, hammer cloth on site at the London Museum. Um, as you can see it, again, quite labor intensive, um, took a day to reattach and re-sew the braid at the top on the top edge of the hammer cloth. But again, as you can see that because we've worked sympathetically with the colors, they actually don't look too out of place with the existing trims that remained in situ. So there's that image. And then there's another image here where you can see when we took the original, well, when I took the original drops off, I left a little tag of the thread so that we knew exactly when we came back to replace them, they would go back in the exactly same place where they came off. So this is the hammer cloth with everything reattached how it should be. So we were quite proud of this because we felt it was quite a sympathetic restoration that obviously the, um, drops were back into a usable condition, but they didn't look out of place where the remaining trims had been. And the tie backs, although they would turn the other way around and they got the new elements, again, they didn't look out of place and it just looked right for how the museum wanted it to be. So it's just another, another view of the actual hammer cloth itself. And then obviously this is the carriage where the hammer cloth would sit. So if you look right at the end, that's the original hammer, hammer cloth before the actual trims are put on. And if you look back slightly, you've got the red bar at the front. That is where the hammer cloth would sit. And that's where the dragger would sit on the actual um, carriage. This is um, a project we did with the National Trust. It's at Kedleston Hall. We were quite pleased to do this job because it's actually quite a local it's a local hall to Derbyshire and it's actually just on the edge of Derby so it was a nice project to have they wanted to restore the state bed back to the condition it would have been seen at in the 1700s um the original gold trims had got very tarnished 
obviously the fabric was deteriorating. The, these pictures are post-restoration, not pre-restoration. Um, and um, it all looked very tired. This is what the trims look like actually in situ. And as you can see, even the bed covering has failed. Uh, Fabric's faded. faded. Um, so there was the main components. There was a plate braid, which you can see on the left, a lace braid. So we had to collaborate, or we collaborated with a lace maker from Nottingham. Um, it's traditional area for lace making. So it was appropriate to use somebody from that area with the right skills to be able to make the lace. And then on the right, you can see the central rosette to the bedspread that obviously was starting to look very tired. And then the other elements, there was a, the hand, a metallic bullion fringe with a hand woven gimp braid at the top. As you can see there, you wouldn't actually believe that that was pure gold with how brown and dirty it gone. And the tassel on the right, again, they were just showing their age and were looking very tired. Oxidized, um, I think they would be environment. Not, not to the standard of what a state bed should be showing. So the National Trust actually wanted to bring the bed back to have the wow factor it would have had when it was new. So the next slide's actually, this is the before, and then this is the after. after. So the twisted bullion fringe on the left, we had to devise a technique that mimicked the original because we couldn't use the same techniques as um, was used originally because either we haven't got the machinery or obviously labor, labor was viewed very differently then and um, we couldn't, it's just Obviously, cost wise, isn't it? It was a, it was a big cost difference. Probably so then, we yeah. actually devised a way of machine weaving it, but in a hand woven way. I actually put every twist in that fringe, so I'm quite proud of it. Um, we had to to get the heavy weight of it. We had to weave double the amount that was required, and then sew it together so that we got the weight of the original fringe but in a more modern way of producing. Um, the gimp braid at the top, that was hand woven, but again, we had to make the cord here in the factory and get, a, get our hand weaver to weave it into the actual braid. Um, we were actually really pleased with the result. There's thousand twists per meter in the bullion so as you can see that was quite a lot of work again but it got the result we wanted so we were really proud of it and again on the right you can see the tie back that it's looking more how it should do it's got its gold outer skirt back and you can see the silk under skirt more clearly um, obviously the gold netting now has got the bling factor that it should have so it looks stunning in place. It was a difficult one as well because uh, obviously over time things rot away so the mould's got quite a curvaceous shape and we had to try and recreate that which was quite a difficult thing because obviously over time the silk's kind of given way and it's gone tight against the mould so it was quite an interesting one, trying to recreate the shape of the mould. We had to use, we had to cling film it and try and um, net it on the actual mould itself without damaging the silk underneath. So we had some entertaining times with regards to how we put that together. But I think overall, I think it's got a really good shape to it now. And, it, and it looks to be honest, these shape. challenges are what we probably enjoy about the job, that it it it's very satisfying to have the old and the new together and think yeah we've done the old old trim justice so this is um the back of the loom where we had to set the chevron plate braid up this was another challenge that we were actually trying to get a flat plate to run 
flat and level through a loom that's used to using round yarn because obviously most yarns are a round thread whereas we had to try and to get the braid to look properly finished and to the quality it was required we were needing to keep the plate flat all the way through the machine so you're looking at keeping the plate flat probably for a distance of eight ten feet from the back of the loom so to the yeah, front so I had, had, it, we had to adapt a tensioning method to keep the plate so that it stayed the right way up all the way through and on the right you can actually see the twisted weft that we had to use to obviously then lock the plate into the, the plate weft into place in the braid and again that has its own challenges because gold thread by its own nature is very springy so if you take a springy yarn and make an even springier cord you then have to kill the twist so we have to steam everything to um, deaden the twist so that we can actually then weave with it so it had Quite a lot of challenges yeah these are actually a few images from our lace maker so the the spools at the bottom we provided her with the twisted gold thread and in there also you've got the plate so you can see the pattern she worked from and we will show you some more images in a second of the different designs that we use but it just shows how much time was actually involved in these these trimmings this is one of the designs. So again, this is using the flat plate in there, um, as well as the twisted um, silk, a twisted metallic thread, sorry. Yeah. Um, and again, a different type of design. These were all used on the bed in different places. So these are all as close to the originals as we could possibly do. Um, this project in its entirety was probably started early. In fact, we went into Kedleston Hall in the January to start collecting the information ready to be able to produce the trimmings. Um, and we had probably started producing early February and the whole project was complete and up in the house by, was it the following October? Yeah, yeah so it was over a year's work between ourselves and the upholsterers that made the bed cover the people who actually re restored the bed frame because to be it, it had to be re-gilded re as well to reflect the um brightness of the trim so and this is the last lace obviously that was produced this is probably the most complex one that we did actually look beautiful when they're actually on the bed um, and this is a flat plate braid, as you can see, by its nature, any twists in the plate would have shown up horribly. So we were quite proud of the fact that we did keep it running flat and smooth for, we think there must have been over 100 metres of braid. Yeah, and that was weaving at about three and a, three and a quarter, three and three quarter metres an hour. So it's not the quickest weaver, but a beautiful no. braid in the end. And then these are just a few elements. So the actual uh, left, this is one rosette that we did that ended up in the middle of the bedspread. Um, it's actually only about two inches um, across. It actually looks a lot bigger on the screen. So it was really, really difficult to work with because obviously everything's so tiny and so intricate. And obviously just a couple of more pictures of the mold that we worked on for the tassel. And then obviously the another picture of the lace. And then this is a bed actually completed. So you can see where the lace has been used, where the fringe has been used and where the braids have been used. And it looks absolutely stunning with all the, the new gilding on the bed and the new fabrics. And our last project, this is another restoration um, one that we've done. We did it for East North Castle. Um, so what we had to do, we had to remake um, a braid and two fringes. So the actual first chair you'll see there, we haven't actually got a photograph of this one finished, but you can see how bad repair this was actually in. Obviously over time it's rotted away with it being silk, but there was an issue with regards to obviously the cost of it. So we did a synthetic restoration, but using different materials so that the cost, we kept the cost down. 
So the, the slide on the right hand side, you can see this is the original braid. So the top one is the back. So again, you get a, be a better color reflection from the back of the braid. And obviously the front of the braid, you can see where it started to rot away again. So wherever the studs are, you've got a really good piece of braid. Wherever the studs aren't, you can see where the warp's rotted away and then the braid's literally fallen to pieces. So it's just, just lost its structure. Um, this is a trellis fringe that sits along the bottom of the chair. And this would have been in spun silk originally. And then again, another picture here where you can see how badly rotted the tassels actually were. And obviously where the braids just completely disintegrated. And then these are the finished single chairs, obviously with the trellis fringe on them, the braid in place and the colours back to how they would be. Um, and that's that. and um, Nick Knowles actually did a programme on East Mill Castle and which you can see the chairs that we worked in, they're on there as well. So there's a really interesting thing to have a look at if you get the fans. And um, um, Hannah is actually going to play a video for you. Um, it's called Weaving Pure Gold that we couldn't actually play originally at the start. And it just shows you how we worked on the Kettleston project. So, so we're going to, we're going to stop sharing and so that Hannah can show you the video now. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I think especially um, there are a couple of projects there where I've heard bits from the conservation side before. So mm -hmm. getting to see some more of those kind of really intricate details was fascinating. Yeah. We have had some questions through and we've got yeah, that's fine. Minutes, so let's jump straight in. Um, the first question is, do you also dye your warps and wefts on site? Maybe you could talk a bit more about how you're kind of sourcing your materials and where you're getting different things from. No, we don't dye here on site, but if our stock yarns haven't got the specific colour we need, we do know of dyeing facilities where we can get the right colour dyed for the project if that's what the client requires. Well, because we're now part of the Edward Alexander group as well, um, actually Gainsborough, the fabric weavers, they have a yarn um, dye on site, so we do get our silks and things dyed through them. So if there is a specific colour that the client wants dye in, we will always try and get that sorted out for them. Brilliant. Um, and the next question is, how many employees are at the company? And then part two, do you take on interns or trainees? Um, I'm quite interested in that as well, like how that works about getting yeah. in there for a very long time. I guess there must be other people coming up through the ranks. Um, there's 10 of us. So we're not a large workforce. Um, with the takeover, we're actually hoping that by some method, we can actually start some kind of apprenticeship so that we can keep these skills alive. At the moment, at the moment, we're finding it very difficult to get connected to a college to be able to run the apprenticeships. But it's something that we, basically it's our dream to be able to set up some kind of apprenticeship system so that we can actually pass these skills down. Yeah, because a lot of our work workforce is older. Um, so yeah, it's really going to be important in the future to get younger people in there and train them up through the ranks. But Ruth said we've got 10 employees in the factory, but we also have people that work from home. So in and around Derby, we've got out workers that work from home. So they're self-employed. So they do tasseling and things like that at home um, so they can work the hours they want. And it's just... A lot of them are young mums as well, so it kind of gives them the opportunity to work from home and obviously look after children and things like that. So, so to the anonymous attendee, yeah, if a client was looking to have wooden core tassels cut in synthetic, we do deal with synthetic materials as well. So, so yeah, basically we will work to whatever the brief is for the client. So if they want synthetic materials, we use synthetic. If, they want silk, wool, cotton, we'll, we'll, work, use, we'll well. work with that as well. So yeah, yeah, and basically anything goes. So we have the facility, we have all the arms on site. So do you ever use lace machines and companies who have lace machines? We don't actually get asked that often to replicate the lace. This was kind of a real one-off project, wasn't it? Where we've ever been asked to do the lace replication so 
Although it's also handy to know about companies like Clooney Lace, because if we ever get an inquiry, at least we've got a yeah, source option. now to uh, tap into. Yeah, lovely. So, yeah. and then we've got one person asking whether the talk will be available to rewatch later. Oh, yes, it will. Um, I'm starting to see some questions again. So thank you yeah, so for like ca catching up. Um, yes. So the event is being recorded and um, Icon Head Office will distribute that to everybody who's booked on. So if you know of anybody who booked on but couldn't be here today, they should get automatically emailed a link in the next few weeks. So if by the new year you've not heard anything, um, let one of us in the textile group know and we'll get that sorted out for you. Um, I, think, I think that was it. Yeah. yeah, I think we've reached the end of our questions. Um, Heather Porter has made a great pun about fantas fantastic, which yeah, I think yeah. is appropriate. <laughs> <for it. laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think all that remains is to say thank you both so much. It's been a really enjoyable afternoon. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. And